Uh, hi, hello, thanks for joining uh, us this evening um, on this uh, Tenant Thursday segment today. Uh, we will be discussing housing issues and protections for survivors of gender-based violence, uh, including the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act and the Fair Housing Act. Uh, my name is Alex Escobedo and I am the Communication and Events Coordinator here at Lawyers Committee for Better Housing, or uh, LCBH. Uh, we have two very special guests. Um, with me today, uh, Jackie Koryat, uh, Supervisory Attorney at Legal Aid Chicago, and our very own Legal Director, uh, Michelle Gilbert. Uh, thanks for being with us this evening. Um, and before I, we get jump into the questions and kind of run on, I do want to make kind of more of an admin invitation. Uh, so next week, we will, Ten and Thursdays will not be happening uh, because we have our annual fall benefit, Bringing Justice Home event, uh, which will be taking uh, place on the 12th of November, which is next Thursday at 6 p.m. Uh, I do have the invitation. So if you want to join and you want to attend, it's a free virtual event. Uh, the registration link is in the description of this video, and I will be posting it into the comment section of this video uh, very shortly. Um, and I do want to make the reminder that if you have any immediate concerns that are not related to the topic or the segment of today's Senate Thursdays, so please go to renovention.com or give us a call at 312-347-7600. Um, and I will be posting that information as well into the comment section of this video. Um, but if you do have any questions regarding today's topic, please drop them into the comment section. I do have another monitor, monitor to watch the questions and we can ask them to our attorneys on this call today. Uh, with all that said, uh, all, with all the information aside, we definitely kind of can jump in. Um, so uh, Jackie, what is the Violence Against, Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act? Well, thanks for asking, Alex. So before I jump into that, uh, one of the things I always like to say when I talk about these issues is that some of the things Michelle and I are gonna be talking about tonight um, have to do with domestic violence, sexual violence. I know that those can be triggering for people. And so I just wanna give people a heads up that that's kind of gonna be the content of what we're discussing today. Um, so the Violence Against Women, or, the Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act is a federal law that protects survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, and stalking. Um, and so it's, it's mainly geared towards people that are living in subsidized housing. Um, in order for the protections to apply, you have to be in a covered housing program, uh, which the law defines as most subsidized programs. Got it. Um, and so who does it, who does it protect? I think it should be very kind of common, but just kind of diving into kind of what it protects and who it protects. Sure. So uh, the law is geared towards protecting survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking, dating violence. So I do a lot of these cases in my work. I'd say I spend maybe 80% of my time doing this type of work and Statistically, I think we know that gender-based violence isn't limited to women, but, um, and it can apply to men and there are male survivors, but the majority of cases that we see just statistically are for women. And so a lot of the cases that we see at Legal Aid Chicago and I'm sure LCBH sees as well are for uh, women in their homes and that's who it's protecting. Um, I just like to highlight that, um, you know, obviously we're very happy that uh, Violence Against Women Act exists. I keep going to say VAWA, but now I'm, I'm trying to say the full law so that if people jump in in the middle of the presentation, they know what I'm talking about in case they don't know the acronym. Um, but we're ha very happy it exists because uh, people that survive gender-based violence in their home face a lot of barriers moving forward because a lot of times they're held responsible for the acts of their abusers. Or, you know, it could be that the domestic violence they've experienced has affected their tenancy or future tenancies through evictions on their record. And so the Violence Against Women Act is a way to protect against some of those things happening, or, you know, it permits people to move in programs. And so it's a really powerful tool. And if it's helpful, I could go through some of just like broad strokes of some of the protections that it provides. Yeah, if you if you can, that'd be very helpful for um, and very informational for our viewers too. Great. So I, I would say the three main protections, the first and probably the most commonly known is that it prevents someone from being evicted from subsidized housing for an incident of domestic violence. Um, and so that's really important because um, like I said, a lot of incidents happen in the home, especially if we're 
thinking about right now. I mean, with COVID-19, not a lot of people are going out. There's, you know, stay at home orders that are happening. And so people are confined to their home. And I mean, that, that puts stress on even a very healthy relationship. So if you're looking at a violent or a relationship with violence in it, then you have to understand that it, it creates additional stress and additional incident of domestic violence. However, if someone's in subsidized housing, if there's an incident in the home of domestic violence, you know, for example, um, like maybe there's a noise complaint because um, people are arguing, or you know, if someone has to call the police a number of times, those can't serve as a reason for that person to be evicted from their housing. Um, so the second uh, main area where we work a lot is with emergency transfers. So obviously subsidized housing varies in terms of you know, the different programs. They're all very intricate with their rules, but I think the way they're most distinguished is if uh, a program is project-based or if it's tenant-based. And so um, what the Violence Against Women Act provides is that no matter what type of subsidy you have, the housing provider is required to have an emergency transfer plan. So in that emergency transfer plan, they're supposed to set out how you can transfer with your subsidy if you're experiencing domestic violence. This is important because for a tenant-based voucher, I mean, you can move and housing providers have you know, plans in place so that you can get moving papers quickly and move your voucher to a different unit. But if you're in a subsidy that's project-based or it's based in your unit, it can be really tricky to decide what happens next. Um, with when you experience an incident of violence because some survivors are in a position of choosing, do I stay with my home, which is really the only place that I can afford, or you know, do I choose my safety? And so the Violence Against Women Act prevents people from having to make those decisions because housing providers are supposed to have this plan so that survivors can transfer with their subsidy to a different project-based unit. Um, and so the last protection I'm just gonna go into really quickly is lease bifurcation. And so um, if it, this is mainly geared towards domestic violence, but if someone's experiencing domestic violence, it's possible that it's someone that's living in their home or who's on their lease. And so what the Violence Against Women Act permits housing providers to do is to bifurcate the lease. So it permits them to continue to provide assistance to the survivor while terminating assistance to the person that's perpetrating the violence. And so that's another really powerful tool so that the survivor is not held responsible um, while the person that's perpetrating the violence is removed out of the household. Um, you know, obviously there's safe ways to do that and housing authorities try to do that, I think the best they can in terms of maybe getting the survivor moved based on emergency transfer or, or helping them uh, implement safety provisions in their home prior to terminating uh, the perpetrator violence from, from the lease. Um, so those are, those are the main protections. There's some other ones, obviously the law is really intricate, but um, I think those are kind of the highlights. Definitely, and, and thank you for that information. Um, now I wanna ask about another act that we we tend to cover, we've covered kind of in a couple of segments here on Tenant Thursdays, which is the Fair Housing Act. Um, and does that, the, does, does the Fair Housing Act provide any protections for survivors of gender-based violence? Sure, so the Fair Housing Act is great. Um, and a lot of times I use the Violence Against Women Act and the Fair Housing Act together because they're both strong protections, but they kind of apply in different situations, I'll say. So the Fair Housing Act, you know, covers almost any stage of housing. So, you know, applications, when you're living there, eligibility, um, you know, termination from your housing. Um, and it applies to both subsidized housing and private housing. That's really important because if we're looking back to what I just said about the Violence Against Women Act, you can't use the Violence Against Women Act for private housing. So if you're looking at a client or a tenant that's only living in a market rate unit, then the Fair Housing Act may be the only protection you really have on these types of issues. And so um, under the Fair Housing Act, it prohibits discrimination based on protected categories. So one of the protected categories is sex. And so sex discrimination encompasses a variety of things. Um, you know, it does, so it's a very broad term, but the main ways that I use it in my work and kind of helping survivors of gender-based violence is either using the Fair Housing Act as a tool when someone is um, being treated unequally due to domestic violence. 
So, uh, you know, I can go back to some of the same examples I used for the Violence Against Women Act and you can kind of see how these laws work together. So if someone, like I said, is calling the police over and over or um, is the landlord says they don't want to rent to someone because there's too much drama and these family issues or they don't want to make repairs because it's a domestic. So um, we would be able to use a Fair Housing Act theory to protect that person and say that the landlord's discriminated against them based on their sex. Um, the way that we're able to do that is through an argument that explains that um, women are overwhelmingly survivors of domestic violence. And so that by targeting someone based on the domestic violence they're experiencing, you truly are targeting women based on the statistics that um, are pretty well known and accepted. The last thing I'll say about the Fair Housing Act and sex discrimination is that it also encompasses sexual harassment. So that's a big issue that we're seeing right now. It's obviously incredibly important. Um, so the reason we're seeing it right now, and I think that a lot of people have seen it in the news, is that um, you know obviously a lot of tenants right now are going through a difficult time, and so sometimes when a tenant's unable to make their rent or you know needs repairs to their unit a landlord will proposition them and try to exchange you know, sexual conduct in exchange for the unpaid rent um, that the tenant may have. And so this, um, and the Fair Housing Act has regulations that are geared towards harassment and they specifically identify that um, a landlord can't create a hostile environment or engage in a quid pro quo. So a good example of a quid pro quo is what I just said, kind of exchanging um, or waiving the rent balance in exchange for a sexual favor. Um, and so those are pretty strong protections and you know, we're lucky that we're, they're in the regulation and well-defined. Yeah, Alex, like, I think a lot of people have heard about sexual harassment in the workplace, uh, mm -hmm. but I think it's really important that tenants know that it protects them in their homes as well, which is really key. You should feel safe in your home and not harassed. Definitely, no, of course. Um, and uh, so what can a survivor do if their landlord violates any of these acts? So I, we're lucky that we've got the Violence Against Women Act, we've got the Fair Housing Act, the city has a fair housing ordinance, the county has a fair ho housing ordinance, the state has a fair housing ordinance. Um, and so under all of these protections, they can file a complaint, either an administrative complaint, a complaint in court, um, they can file a complaint with HUD. And all of those processes look a little bit different. Um, they usually involve some level of investigation if you're kind of going the administrative complaint route, um, or you know, if you're in court, it could potentially be resolved a little bit quicker. Um, and that's typically what we do with most of our claims. Of course, we usually try to resolve it, you know, if we can by contacting the landlord or whoever it is beforehand, just so that we can get a quicker resolution of the problem, especially if there's kind of an imminent risk of harm or if we're worried about the client being safe while, you know, any resolution is pending. I don't want to forget to talk about the Safe Homes Act too, the Illinois. Uh, because that's really important for tenants who need to move. So Michelle makes a good point. So a lot of times we'll pair the Violence Against Women Act and the Fair Housing Act or one of these, you know, uh, more local fair housing ordinances with other protections. So I would say the best known one is probably Safe Homes Act. So in Illinois, that permits tenants to uh, terminate their lease early if they're experiencing domestic or sexual violence. It also permits tenants to get their locks changed. Um, we also have a couple other protections. You know, there's the Gender Violence Act. So that creates a private right of action for survivors against their abusers if they've um, experienced uh, harm, uh, which is a pretty unique thing. And so it, it can be a strong tool for survivors. There's also the Eviction Act, which has an affirmative defense for survivors of domestic violence. Um, so if you know your a case does get in court and a landlord's trying to evict you due to an incident of domestic violence, you have this defense written in the Eviction Act that you can raise explaining that the reason they're trying to evict you is due to domestic violence and the Eviction Act tries to prevent that. Um, there's also a couple uh, little protections uh, that sometimes can be used with these, including utility deposit uh, 
deferrals or um, kind of prohibitions against penalizing someone for contacting emergency services. Um, and so I would say that's kind of like a, a broad overview of a lot of the protections that we sometimes are able to use. And I just want to remind everyone that there is still a moratorium against evictions being filed in Illinois right now because of the pandemic. The governor's moratorium lasts at this point until November 14th, um, although we're quite hopeful that he will extend it um, and carry it through uh, December. But we're still seeing evictions filed. And I, and I could really imagine a situation where there's a domestic violence situation where a landlord tries to bring it in as a health and safety exception to the moratorium. Um, and hopefully, you know, we want to use this this vehicle of tenant Thursday to get the word out to tenants. I mean, those are kinds of cases that we definitely want to take, um, and and would be really excited to work together with Jackie on the domestic violence angle. And if uh, so, if any anyone watching and they want to give a car, they feel like they, they, these acts can protect them. Um, or they're experiencing gender-based violence, do they, they can just go ahead and reach out through intervention and then call the 312-347-7600, which is already in the, the comment section. But is there a number for Legal Aid Chicago or any contact um, that we can share and market that as well? That's a good point. We have our general intake line. We also have our fair housing line, but I'm gonna have to pull it up quickly. I don't have it here, but it'll just take me a second. Um, so our general intake line is 312-341-1070. And then let me see if I can get our fair housing line really quick. Um, and while Jackie's looking that up, I'll just reiterate, our two groups work together just like family. And I would really encourage tenants with subsidies to call Legal Aid first. I mean, Legal Aid is really the best place uh, to help tenants with subsidies. All right, so I've got it here. So our fair housing line, and in terms of our fair housing work, we'll do any of the protected classes, but one of the things that we focus on is sexual harassment and sex discrimination. And so the fair housing line is 312-423-5909. And fair housing cases don't have to be subsidized tendencies, right? That's exactly right. Any kind of housing discrimination. Yes. Perfect. And I'm writing those uh, numbers and uh, hotlines into the comment section as well. So if you missed them or we said them too fast, you can go ahead and find them into the comment section. Um, that way you can kind of just copy and paste it on your phone if you're on your phone or type it into your phone if you're on your computer. Um, but and I'll open it up. So if you're watching on, on Facebook and you have any questions, please go ahead and put the question into the comment section. Um, that way I can go ahead and ask it to our attorneys here. Um, and while we wait, I'll give it a couple of seconds. I do want to mention just one more time that if you're interested in registering for the, our LCBH's annual fall benefit, bringing justice home, which will be taking place next Thursday at 6 p.m., which is November 12th. Um, so there will be no tenant Thursdays next Thursday. Um, to go ahead and register, the, the registration link is already in the comment section and in the description of this video. Um, and I do want to add that if you're watching this over the weekend or tomorrow or next week, um, and you have any, any questions, uh, still go ahead and comment them. I do take a look at every day at the Tenant Thursday videos to double check, and I do get alerts on my phone if someone comments. Uh, so we can always answer those questions and then uh, give, give you any information or resources that you may need. Um, uh, with that said, let me just double check. It looks like we're not, we don't have any questions coming in. Uh, so I do want to thank both of you for, for joining us this evening. I know it's been a very long day. Um, so it's been a long week. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so uh, with that said, thank you for, for tuning in for another Tenant Thursday segment. Um, like I said, we won't be hosting Tenant Thursdays next week. We will be doing our annual benefit. Uh, so please register if you want to attend. Uh, if not, we'll see you in two weeks on the next Tenant Thursdays. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you.